my name is uh, Tony Rosalawa. I'm the scientific manager for um, Open Air. Um, today, I'll just give a brief uh, presentation to tell those of you um, uh, who don't, aren't familiar with Open Air, which uh, a lot of you will be, um, a, a little bit about Open Air and why we are involved uh, with the field of open peer review. So. Um, Open Air is, a, is an e-infrastructure for open science. We are a, a e, with an EC-funded project. We're now in our third phase of project funding. We've been going since uh, 2009. Um, and our, um, our mission has evolved along with the open access policies of the European Commission. So we were funded by the European Commission to help implement and monitor their open access policies. Uh, the European Commission, since 2008, had a pilot on open access. We helped uh, disseminate information on that um, and monitor uh, uh, levels of uh, compliance with the open access. Um, and then in Horizon 2020, um, now, the open access uh, pilot is extended to a mandate. So the European Commission, all funds for Horizon 2020 projects now require open uh, all, that all publications be made open access. The, it's a, the mandate is a green mandate, so even if you publish in um, APC journals, you still must deposit within a repository, uh, deposit your paper within a repository. Um, although the EC does pay for APCs both from project budgets, but now also we are running a pilot to disseminate funds post-pilot. Uh, this is called the FP7 post-grant pilot. And then, the, um, becoming more progressive with open science, the European Commission, um, at the start of this year, um, had an open data pilot. This was for about 20% of projects in Horizon 2020, um, in the same way as the, uh, as the open access pilot. Um, and this was, projects had to commit, taking part in the pilot had to commit to making the, all the raw data that underpins uh, claims in scientific publications, they had to commit to making that um, openly accessible. We've just found out that from 2017, this will now become, the, it's, the word isn't mandate yet, but it will become open data by default. Lots of very easy opt-outs um, if you have concerns over sensitivity or um, competition or so on. Very easy opt-outs, but it will, open data will become the default within Horizon 2020 from 2017. And so we can see here the evolution. The, the key concern at first was open access to publications. This was, op this was really, um, and for the, uh, for the European Commission, it was the, the, the key. And for Open Air, it was the key. Open Air stands for Open Access Infrastructure for Research in Europe. We were very much focused on open access. But as the European Commission has evolved, and we like to think that they have evolved with us as well, but so we have evolved with them. And so now uh, open air is very much an open science infrastructure for Europe. Um, how do we do this? We provide, uh, we have a network of, uh, uh, of open ac national open access desks that provide awareness um, and help to harmonize and align policies, that provide support and training in, um, in how and what open science is, how you do it. Um, we also provide interop interoperability and services. So we have, on the one hand, this human network, and on the other side, a digital network. The current project phase is Open Air 2020. It, is, uh, it has 50 partners from all, over the, from all over Europe. We're in every EU country and more. And we consist of data centers, universities, libraries, and especially repositories. Um, to talk a little about the human infrastructure of open air, um, the, the human infra infrastructure, the backbone of it, is the, the network of national open access desks. So we have local representatives in every European country, every EU country and beyond. So we're also in Norway, uh, Turkey, Serbia, and so on. And they provide local support to, um, for open access training and support. They um, help to align policies 
from the EC level down to the local level, and they also provide technical assistance. Um, to find your uh, uh, National Open Access Desk, just go to the Open Air Portal uh, forward slash uh, NOADS. And then finally, so we, the human infrastructure is about, from a European level, from the EC level, trying to bring that implementation right down to the national and to the local level, the institutional level. But then we also don't want to just be a European silo. Um, of course we don't want that. So we then, then have outreach via the um, Coalition of Open Access Repositories, by, via CORE. We have outreach to similar organizations in, uh, in the rest of the world. Most, uh, uh, we're in very advanced discussions with um, La Referencia. They have, um, in Latin America, a, a similar network. They've recently taken up our guidelines. And we also hold talks with CORE, with uh, SHARE in the US, for example. So this is the human infrastructure. And here, and this is the technical infrastructure. I won't spend too long here, but I just want you to look at the left-hand side. So we, the European, the EC's policy is a green open access mandate, okay? And we are, a repos we are an infrastructure that is very much originally based on repositories. So repositories, institutional repositories and um, uh, subject repositories are very much the, the the backbone of, uh, of our architecture at first. So what we do is we publish guidelines for repositories to say, publish your metadata in this standardized format, and then we can aggregate it so we can act as the finding agent for all the very diverse um, repositories of Europe for the EC to be able to check that their publications that they are funding have been made open access. So this is the monitoring aspect. So it's built on repositories, but we also take from uh, CRIS systems, from research information systems, um, and also straight from open access journals. And increasingly, we will be um, taken from data repositories as well, because with the open data pilot, we, we are now very keen to um, move forward with the linking of data to publications. Um, uh, we, once we have all this information, um, our tech people do some really clever things on, with text and data mining to find which projects they belong to, um, which institutions, uh, um, they link the data to the publications and so on here. And then this allows things like discovery, monitoring, reporting and so on. And the result is this is the open air information space. It's 14 million publications with 7 million authors. Um, more than 690 data providers, um, and lots of data sets, lots of publications, lots of organizations linked to each other. So the ideal being that the European Commission or any funders could go and um, look, they funded this project, how many publications came from this project, which in, with which impact, and they can then see levels of compliance with open access, but they can also see um, uh, what impact their research is having. Open access, um, open air 2020, we've uh, broadened our remit, like I said, into open science. So we are, for example, we, uh, our, uh, our information is all openly available via API, but we're also making it available now by linked open data. That service is already in beta. Um, we are doing lots of things with the, um, uh, with the RDA and with the World Data System, WDS World Data System, in terms of data citation and late, uh, literature data integration. We also are looking at legal issues in, in open data, um, issues of data protection and public sector information in open data. We're looking at new metrics for open access. And, as, and one more task uh, we are looking at is open peer review. Um, the idea being that open science is more than open access. It's about open process, open results, and open processes. Um, we'll talk about this a lot today, so I won't uh, dwell on it, but traditional, problem, traditional peer review has problems. We know that. And these are some of the, some of the, the claims of problems with, with traditional peer review. And open peer review, of its many colors, is thought to be able to tackle some of these problems. So 
one thing that I would like, um, in the breakout groups this afternoon, one of the things uh, that I would really like to work on is the question of what is open peer review? Because I think a lot of people, uh, um, I think sometimes we make competing claims and we're arguing past each other because if I say open peer review is, is helps with incentive, if you have a different model of, in, of open peer review in mind that doesn't have anything to do with incentive, you'll say, no, this is stupid. So I think one of the main problems that we have and that a forum like this and going forward, um, maybe we can work on this together, is to define what we mean by open peer review. And for me, it's an umbrella term. Uh, traditionally, open, traditionally, peer review is anonymous, at least usually single or double blind. So it's anonymous. And it's selective in that um, the, the reviewers are usually selected by editors. And it's opaque in that the reviews neither the reviews or the process are made public. So my conception of open peer review is any type of new peer review that changes one of these factors um, in order to tackle one of the perceived problems of peer review. So openness in peer review for me means either absence of anonymity, so open identity, it, or self-selecting reviewers, meaning um, open participation, perhaps here also open commentary comes into play, or public processes and public reviews. And this would be open access peer review, I suppose. Why is, um, what is open air doing? So we, um, uh, we've been doing a, a, a landscape scan um, of initiatives and models and so on. We will have a report coming. We will um, uh, uh, put out a stakeholder survey in, um, in July uh, on specific issues. And we've also um, used the infrastructure, the open air infrastructure as a seedbed for small scale experimentation with open peer review. The first one um, today was from uh, Open Edition. Uh, my French is not so good. But Pierre Monnier is here and he'll be chairing the panel later. Um, this was a, um, really treated open peer review as a social rather than technical problem. Um, they used existing technologies, so they used a blog platform, hypothesis.org, um, for open reviews, and they used um, hypothesis.is, the annotation software, for open commentary. So <coughs> this wasn't about the technology at all. It was about the mediation and trying to get, uh, um, get people involved. They did experiments uh, with open review and with open commentary. Um, next, um, the result of a, a technical that we held uh, was Josh. From the, uh, we have Josh Nicholson here. He'll speak shortly. Um, and uh, Josh runs the Winnower, um, an, an open access journal for grey literature. Um, and with them, the experiment was to try and incentivize post-publication peer review, specifically journal club reviews. You'll hear more about this later. And provide a platform for reviews of for uh, repository content generally and Zenodo content specifically. And then finally, um, Open Scholar and uh, Pandelis is here. Um, he will be on the panel later as well. Um, they produced um, an open peer review module plugin for DSpace repositories. This is a plugin which um, can be added to an institutional or subject repository, which makes, them in, which makes it into a functional evaluation platform. Uh, includes published reviews, disclosed identities, reviewer reputation system, um, and the complete code is open source and available on GitHub. Pandelis will give you, tell you more later. Um, so, just to uh, end, <laughs> I just thought that I would give my two cents on um, where open peer review should go in future. And for me, um, I, would, I definitely think that we need to uncouple peer review from publishing. It's, peer review is another stage in the production of academic material. It's a necessary stage. I don't think that there is any other, any better way of um, of. Re of reshaping our material uh, or acting as the, um, the filter than to have peers judging the work. But um, I, I would hope that we would see 
more services that function just as peer review platforms. Um, I'm thinking here of things like Peerage of Science. Um, uh, and then the repository infrastructure here comes into play because if you have repositories or preprint servers or postprint servers, and then you have a peer review module, if you have the repositories here, the researcher just puts the preprint here, you have the, the peer review module here, and the two can interact, then you have a functional um, platform to get publications to an advanced stage. You would then need, of course, need publishing software at, at the next stage. But So the idea then is to federate open peer review services. Um, we need to agree, and so we need standardization. Like I said, we need to agree what we're talking about when we're talking about open peer review, and we need to agree what models we're talking about. Um, it would be great if we could agree how we measure the effectiveness of open peer review. For example, our experiments were small, were small scale, and a lot of the results were, um, were such that the, there wasn't enough uh, critical mass to be able to give authoritative answers. It was just, this shows in this direction. Um, and, but how do we make studies, such studies, comparable so that we can use them to build an evidence base to say what works in what circumstances? This is something I think that we should work on. And finally, um, with this idea of federating services, I think that we need, uh, and with this idea, coupled to this idea of, the, of a vocabulary for open peer review, um, we can, I, I think perhaps we need to move towards standardization of metadata so that we can encode within reviews. If, if reviews are to become, public, to become uh, research objects themselves, so that we can encode what kinds of open peer review this is under which circumstances and make that uh, so that this information can be shared between services so that it's not locked in silos. These are my thoughts for um, the future of open peer review. Um, I thank you all very much for coming today and um, I, I think we're going to have a really great day. Um, I hope everything goes as planned. I'm sure it won't, but I hope um, you bear with us if it doesn't. Um, so that's thank you from me. Um,